Well, good morning, State Line Baptist Church. Uh, well, good to be uh, back online again, uh, getting ready to preach this morning. Uh, I tell you what, I am looking forward to church. I, I do not like preaching from home. I want to see your faces. Uh, I don't like learning technology. I don't like relying on whether or not we're going live. Uh, but here we are, and we're doing what we got to do. And I uh, just want to, uh, before we get started, i got a couple things. I um, uh, I sent out a request to our church and asked a lot of them, say, you know, it, of our singers and those who uh, uh, play instruments and whatnot, send me some uh, singing videos at home that we can uh, open up our online service with that. And I got, I got well, one came in so far, and as well as me and Lauren did something last night. And uh, before we get started, I want to um, I gotta make sure i got my computer thing ready to go here. Uh, before we get started, I want to read you a, a little verse here this morning. In uh, Mark chapter 4, the disciples are on, on a ship of Jesus. Jesus is asleep in the, in, down at the bottom of the boat there, and uh, a storm rises up. And, uh, and as the storm takes off, the next thing you know, the boat's filling up with water. It seems all is lost. And, uh, and, the, and the disciples were worried, you know, it, does Jesus got this thing under control? What's going on? And, uh, and then you get down to verse 39 in Mark 4, it says this, And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace be still, and the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. Uh, that was a reminder to the disciples that Jesus got this whole thing under control. Uh, this week I've had uh, a lot of people ask for prayer requests. Uh, I mean, the world's in chaos right now. we got people losing their job, the unemployment rate at an all-time high. Uh, we're looking at financial issues and all that stuff, blah, 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 and all that. I, and then we got the health risks, and I know people are asking for prayer. We're praying for people who may have it, may not have it, wait for tests for that. Um, sometimes in the midst of this, Jesus allows the boat to fill up with water. Uh, but in our story, we learn that no matter what, Jesus got this whole thing under control. He's the one that controls everything. Uh, by him and through him are all things made. So we're not worried about about what tomorrow holds. Uh, one thing for sure, Jesus knows our situation, and he's doing something here. Uh, we're going to sing a song. Actually, me and Lauren set up last night recorded a song uh, uh, called, uh, um, I can't remember what it's called, uh, uh, Till the Storm Passes. That's what it is. So I'm going to click this up and play for you, and then we're going to go on to preach. So uh, grab your Bibles while and, and get ready, uh, but first we're going to have a song.
storm passes by, till the storm passes by. Amen. I, uh, uh, last night I told Lauren, I said, I said, we need a song. We need a song that uh, uh, talks about uh, Jesus in the midst of everything we're going through. And, uh, and that's why uh, last night we sat down and done that. But uh, tonight we got another song. Brother Carol Speck will be singing. He sent me a video song he made up for us, and we'll be playing that tonight. Uh, but for now, uh, I, I, uh, folks, let me tell you something. I miss y'all. <laughs> uh, I'm looking forward to getting back. I'm looking forward to this. And the storm will pass by. It's going to be over soon. And, uh, and, and no matter what, Jesus is in control. And we're going to be back in the church house. I'm going to be doing somersaults all the way to the pulpit. Uh, I can't wait to get back. I miss seeing y'all. I miss hearing from y'all. Uh, it's one thing to, to hear from you by phone or text message or, or talk to you on Facebook or whatever. But it's a whole other thing to be able to see you in church. Uh, I'm looking forward to getting back. Uh, but right now we got a message you want to preach. Uh, a title message. If you turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and uh, we're going with one verse, verse 16. Uh, it, I want you to really pay attention to what Paul says here. 1 Corinthians 9 in verse 16, if you turn there, in the midst of this, uh, God's just really led me in a, a few different ways and a few different sermons to preach on and everything the world's going on at right now. Uh, there's a lot of things I could preach on, uh, and I will preach on more uh, on this topic. But right now, God's really put it on my heart to, to talk to you and educate our people on how important it is to reach out to people for the, uh, with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Every one of us. Uh, how important it is to reach our loved ones, our family, and e every creature around the face of this earth. Uh, it's important. Right now, I believe, uh, like I said, I, I, as I said in previous sermons, what is God doing in all this? And I've got my, my reasons, what I think he's, he's doing. But the one thing I can say, beyond the shadow of a doubt right now, what he's absolutely doing is he is opening up the door uh, for lost people to, to want to be saved. Uh, I, I've heard of a lot of people are messaging me, asking questions. I've got uh, a church family are, are reaching out to me and saying, pray for my family who's not saved and all this. Uh, no matter whether this is, uh, and I've talked to people in our church, I say, is this, is this epidemic being blown out of proportion? It's more than what it really is? I don't know. Uh, some are saying, you know what, or maybe are they under-reporting it or whatever, and, and, and maybe that's the case. I don't know. Uh, one thing I do know for sure, beyond a shadow of a doubt, is that, that God has opened up people's hearts right now. And He's given us the privilege to tell people about His Son. And, I, and, and that's why Wednesday night I'm going over soul winning. And this morning I want to preach on the topic, of, or my, the title of my message this morning is, Why Preach the Gospel? Why is it so important that each and every one of us preach the gospel? I want you to look at what Paul says here. Uh, uh, look at the, I want you to read with me. But not just read with me. I want you to listen to the, the emphasis Paul puts on preaching the gospel here. Uh, chapter 9, 1 Corinthians, verse 16. Paul says this, For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. He said, I'm not in this for my glory. There's no, this is a selfless thing. He says, For necessity is laid upon me, yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. Woe is unto me. If I preach not the gospel, I want to dissect this verse at the beginning of my sermon here, and I want to give you seven reasons why I think drove Paul to this point to where he says, Woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day you've given us. Lord, I, I know we're on the internet, and I know uh, this is a little different than what we're used to. But Father, I pray and ask, Lord, help me to preach. Help me to say exactly what you'd have me to say, nothing more, nothing less. Lord, help me to preach as though I'm, uh, I'm in my pulpit at church, Lord. Help our, our people to listen as though they're sitting in their pew at church, Lord. Lord help us to, and maybe some that don't even come to our church, Lord. I pray and ask this morning that you would help us, everyone, to understand how important it is, Lord, that we tell others about Jesus Christ. Help us to, help us to get the same burden that Paul has here, the desperate need to tell somebody about Christ. Father, I, I pray and ask where maybe somebody here is listening, uh, whether it be by Facebook or whether it be uh, on the YouTube channel, Father, I pray and ask, Lord, that you would just, if there's somebody here that's not saved, Lord, I pray and ask today they would realize their sinful condition, realize they need Jesus Christ with a believing heart. They bow their head and ask Jesus to save them. Father, in everything that's said and done, Lord, you would get the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 
I always said you may be seated. If you were standing at home, you can go ahead and be seated. <laughs> uh, before I get uh, answer the question, why preach the gospel? Uh, I want to break this verse down just a little bit. Um, first off, before we answer the question, we got to ask the question: What is the gospel? Uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4, uh, gives us an explanation of what is the gospel. I, I mean, it clears the muddy waters. We don't have to ask. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, he says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. Okay? Verse 1, right off, is, I'm going to tell you what the gospel is. All right? Throw out denominations, throw out what everybody else believes in the world. I'm going to tell you exactly what the gospel is. He says, which I preached unto you. Get this, he says, which also ye have received. And get this, and wherein you stand. You stand on the gospel. And we're going to explain exactly what it is. Verse 2, he says, listen to this. By which also you're saved. How are you saved? By the gospel. All right? Very simple, all right? He says, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you believe in vain. Now listen, and then we get to verse 3. And he explains, starts, he tells us exactly what the gospel is. He says, for I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Jesus died for our sins. That's the first part of the gospel. All right. Then verse 4 says, And he was buried and rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Gee, the, the gospel, Paul says, plain and simple is this. The death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that is how you're saved. It's not by your denomination. It's not by your good works. It's not by your baptism. Paul clearly says it's by we're saved, it's the, it, or how we're saved is by the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Clear as, I mean, you can't argue with that. It's very simple. Plain, plain as could be. I had a uh, 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 Joe witness knock on my door. Every once in a while I get them, uh, they come, and sometimes, uh, I used to just kind of like shoo them away, you know, don't want to hear it. But now I kind of play with them a little bit. They come. I had one come to the door. Actually, a few of them come to the door. And uh, I don't tell them I'm a preacher. I don't tell them, you know, I, I study the Bible or anything. I just kind of play dumb. And, uh, and uh, I always ask him this question. I, I ask him, I say, well, listen, how do I get to heaven? I mean, that's the bottom line, whatever religion you are. Ultimately, is we get from this life on to heaven after we die. And I simply ask him, how do you get to heaven? And without, every single time, everyone always says this. Well, they, it's some, something to this effect. Well, you've got to be a good person. Or, you know, you've got to be one of the chosen ones or whatever they give. And then I stop and say, well, that's not what the Bible says at all. The Bible says we get to heaven by the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that alone. That is the gospel, folks. That's how you get to heaven. So we've got to understand, first, what the gospel is. And number two, we've got to understand what preaching is. I, I mean, if, if Paul says, woe unto me if I preach not the gospel, what is preaching? Uh, uh, Strong's Concordance defines preaching as... To announce the good news of the gospel. To announce the good news of Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. That's what the good that's what preaching is. And by the way, preaching isn't just for the pastor. All pastors are preachers, but not all preachers are pastors. We've all been commanded, which we're going to look at here in just a minute, to preach the gospel. Every one of us, if you're born again, you're truly saved, you have been commanded by Jesus Christ to preach the gospel. Matthew chapter 10, verse 27 says, What I tell you in darkness, that speak ye in the light. And what ye hear in the ear, that preach ye on the, upon the housetops. That's to every one of us. Uh, Mark chapter 16, verse 15. And he said unto them, Go into ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. I've had somebody say, Well, that was only given to the apostles. How in the world is, is, is 12 men going to preach the gospel to every creature and while they were on earth, as well as since they've been gone into heaven. No, that verse was given to them and every born-again believer as well. We've all been commanded. No one is uh, without excuse. No one is excused from the command to preach the gospel. We are all in that command. So we understand what the gospel is. We understand what preaching is. Now, what is necessity? Because Paul says uh, uh, necessity is, uh, is laid upon him. Necessity, according to Webster's Dictionary, says that which must be and cannot be otherwise. An irresistible power uh, or a compulsive force. Something that just absolutely must be. You know, there are a few things in this life that you must absolutely have to do. For example, you've got to breathe. <laughs> Try stopping that for about a minute or two and see what happens. Matter of fact, there's something inside you that even if you try to stop breathing, you might pass out and some, there'll be a compelling force inside you to start breathing after you pass out. 
You know, we got to eat, you know. And I found down here since this, this stay-at-home order, I've done a whole lot more than that what I should. I had seven suits, then I then since this order, I think I'm down to two suits that actually fit me anymore. You got to eat if you want to survive. You got to drink fluids, you know. You got There's some things you got to do. You know what? And Paul says, you know what? He equates preaching the gospel to a necessity of anything else in this world. It's just as strong as a compulsion to preach the gospel to do anything else in this world. So putting this all together, Paul says there is no other alternative that he is driven by a powerful force to announce the good news of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ to everyone. He said, that's inside of me. But why? That's the question. Why did, why, why did Paul have great distress? I mean, he says, he says, woe unto me if I preach not the gospel. Woe is to cause great distress. Uh, you know, in other words, to, to not, to, he's got this just burning uh, cry inside him to preach the gospel. He said, matter of fact, if I can't preach the gospel, woe is unto me. I go through great distress. Why does he do that? Why, do, why is there such a passion driving him to, be, uh, to reach somebody uh, for, with the gospel? Why was it such a necessity for Paul? I studied through the scriptures, and I'm going to give you seven reasons this morning. I believe which drove Paul, and, and keep your Bible fingers ready, because we're going to be all over the scriptures this morning. Uh, seven reasons why I believe drove Paul where he, he would, it's just as important to uh, witness Jesus Christ as it is to breathe. And I think once we study these, and I know this ain't a popular message, this ain't a feel-good message, and I know some will probably already clicked off now and say, I've heard about soul winning before, preacher, you preached on it before, blah, 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 or I'm just not interesting, it's not my thing. If you hang tight, and you listen to these seven reasons, I believe you're going to get a burden just like Paul has to where you're, you're going to say, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. Let's just jump right in. First thing, first reason why you must preach the gospel is it's, it's a commandment, not a suggestion. Jesus commanded us to go. He says, in, uh, we already read it, Mark chapter 16, verse 15, and he said unto them, go ye and, and to all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Let's break down a couple of words in this. First, go. Webster's defines go as to walk, to move uh, on the feet, or step by step, uh, to travel, to journey by land or water, to move from one place to another. In other words, there's a movement happening. I, and I got to think about that. Jesus says go. The word go means to travel. I did some study in the scripture when it comes to gospel. Listen to what it says in Romans chapter 10, verse 15. It says, and how shall they preach except they be sent as it is written listen to this how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good news that verse matches right up with the definition of what go is uh, the, the, when you know the gospel and feet go hand in hand because the gospel has to be carried around. <laughs> you know? You, you've got to put your feet on the ground and get to moving and carry that gospel to someone that's not saved. That, uh, matter of fact, let me read you. You know this verse, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 15. It says, And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. You notice how the Bible puts the gospel and preaching along together with feet at least twice that I found in the Bible? Because we've been giving it. And we are, and God expects us to get up on our feet and go into the world and tell somebody about Christ. But the second word I see there is ye. Ye is the plural form of thou, which includes all of us. So when Jesus says, go ye, he's talking about every single one of us getting up off our, our, our couches, getting up out of our lifestyle, and go out into the world and tell somebody about Jesus Christ. That was a command that wasn't a suggestion. That was what Christ had commanded us to do. When he says, go ye, he's not talking about lifestyle evangelism. Let me explain what lifestyle evangelism is. I've heard somebody say, well, you know what? I don't have to tell somebody about Jesus Christ. I'll just live a really good life like Christ, and people will want to come to me and see what's going. Well, yeah, what's uh, my life all about, and I'll tell them about Christ. That, I mean, I understand we ought to live a good life. I'm not saying that. We ought to seek to be holy as He is holy. Obviously, we ought to. But that's not, that's not going ye. <laughs> that's not making an effort to go out. You know, that's not you know, waiting for people to come up and ask you. It's not going. That's not putting feet on the gospel. Uh, it, this is not talking about inviting people to church. Uh, I, I agree. I, I think inviting people to church is a good thing. 
I think that's something every one of us ought to be involved in. But that's not, that's not going in you preaching. That's just inviting your family to church hoping that the preacher preaches the gospel. That's not evangelism. That's not going ye. Going ye is not, is not talking or wearing a t-shirt that says, what would Jesus do? <laughs> you know, Jesus didn't walk around wearing a t-shirt saying, what would I do? <laughs> you know, hopefully somebody will come up to me and want the gospel. No, he went and told people. You know, I, you know, I, I know as a preacher, a lot of times when, uh, like Christmas, birthdays, whatever, uh, I'll get t-shirts that has, you know, Jesus logo on it or something, something about Christ on it. And I like them, I wear them. I, I, but, you know, and I, I wear them all the time. Matter of fact, uh, my, my dresser's filled up with them. I, I'll say this. I have never one time, as far as I know, uh, can ever remember walking into a restaurant, going into the grocery store, going into Walmart, walking up the street, somebody sees me wearing a Jesus shirt, walks up to me and says, please. Tell me how to be saved. I've never had that happen. I, I, one time, I do remember I was in McDonald's in Northeast, and, and I had a, some kind of Jesus logo or some Bible verse on my shirt, and I had an old man walk by, and he just like, did this. That was it. That's all I've got. You know, going ye, going ye is a commandment to follow Christ. That's, a, that's, a, that, that's what we've been told to do. It's, a, um, it's not a suggestion. All right, so it's a commandment. Number two, let's hurry up. We got to hurry. Number two, why go soul winning? Because it works. It works. It's a method that God set up, and it's worked uh, since Jesus walked the face of this earth. And folks, it works today. It's not rocket science. If you go soul winning, people will get saved. Yeah, leave your home, walk up the street, grab some tracks and hand people tracks and hopefully a conversation will open up. Talk to people about Jesus. So, you know, that, that is, you know, uh, as soon as the weather broke, I know we go soul winning at, at, with the youth group uh, uh, about nine months out of the year. When December, January, February it gets kind of cold, we don't, we don't go a whole lot unless we get a nice warm day or at least a day tolerable and people actually talk to you. But we started uh, around late, or about mid-March this year, the youth group went out. We got out twice before this whole thing hit, and people got scared to even talk to people on the street. And uh, so we've been out twice so far. Twice, and in two trips that we went out, we have, uh, we've got to lead two people to the Lord. Uh, one lady named Summer. Uh, she was out in, in the Whitehall development out in Pennsylvania, and she um, played with the kids out in the front yard. Just walked up to her, told her about Christ. Told her about sin, the devastation of sin. Told her about the gospel and how Jesus paid paid it all. And uh, and once once we got done giving her the gospel, she looks at me and she says she wants to be saved. And we right there uh, bowed her head and she called on Christ and asked Christ to save her. And she was all excited, give us all a big hug. Uh, the, the very next week we went out and uh, ran into a fellow named Deshaun. He was out of Philadelphia. Uh, he was uh, just down in Oxford Street. I don't know. I don't even know what he was doing. He was out in the streets. We walked up to him. I asked him about going to heaven, and he's like, oh, I'm a religious kind of person and whatnot. But then when we got down, started talking about sin. Started talking about what the Bible says about being saved. And once he realized it, he's like, I never heard that before. And he looks at me and says, I need to be saved. You know? and, uh, and, and man, I'm telling you, he, it, it was just exciting. Folks, here's the thing. Did, when, we, when you go soul winning, will people say, no, thank you? Yeah, they do. And the, the, they're usually polite. Do people get mad? Yeah, I mean, that, that occasionally happens, yeah. Uh, but, but most people are polite. I, I, rarely do you have an issue, rarely. Uh, you know, but the thing is, we went twice so far this year. And so far, so far this year, two people called on Christ. Two people have their eternal destination changed. Two people never have to worry about the flames of hell. And what did it cost? Two hours. <laughs> That's it. That's all us. You know, I, I, the bottom line is, folks, soul winning works. Whether you, whether you like to door to door knock, whether you like to walk up the street and hand people tracks and talk to them, you know, uh, whatever. Soul winning works. That's the bottom line. Number three, why go soul winning? It reaches way more people if you don't. <laughs> it, it reaches, the, let me read you Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 through 9. This is the law of reaping and sowing. Verse 7 says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of his flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be, verse 9, I love this, and let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap 
if we faint not. Now this is talking about sowing to the flesh, obviously, you, you, know, you can look at it as, as um, uh, you know, things you shouldn't be into, you know, that you're sowing to the flesh, uh, uh, or sowing to the Spirit, reading your Bible, praying, and, and going to church, and all that stuff. Obviously this, but, but think about this from the, from the aspect of soul winning, all right? Uh, the first lesson here we learned is, you reap exactly what you sow. What you know, what you put in the ground is what you're going to get out. You know, you don't plant corn and hope to get tulips. You know, it's just it don't work that way. Verse eight says, let's read that again. It says, says for he that soweth to his flesh shall of his flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the spirit uh, shall of the spirit reap life everlasting. Let me tell you something. I know one thing. Going so long for years and years and years, the flesh will always try to talk you into not going. <laughs> Every single time before you go, it, the, the flesh will rise up and say, well, you know what, it's, nobody's going to listen to you. The flesh will say, why don't you just stay home and relax on the couch, play on Facebook. Or something. The flesh will say, you know what, you, know, you, know, you, know, you, you, you might get in trouble. People, people will get mad at you. And, and the flesh will always say that. Uh, but let me tell you something. If you sow to the flesh and let the flesh, then you're not going to see any soul saved. That's the bottom line. Yeah, you know, you're going. What you what you reap or what you sow is what you're going to reap. If you're sowing nothing, guess what you're going to reap. Second lesson is you reap according to how much you sow. Verse nine says, "And let us not be weary in well doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. If we don't stop, if we keep working those seeds in the ground, you're going to get a production. That's just a, a, you're going to reap according." To what you sow. You know, the more you go out soul winning, the more you're going to reap. Let me use an illustration. I, uh, when all this virus pandemic hit, and, and I don't know why I still don't understand it, but first thing everybody thought about was toilet paper. <laughs> and uh, and uh, me and Nancy didn't jump on the bandwagon right first. You know, we're just going to ride this thing out. We got, we got a supply, and then it wasn't long after the supply started diminishing. It's like, you know what, we probably ought to go look and see if there's any. And uh, so we started going. Realize you didn't just go to one store. Man, we had to go to store after store after store after store before we finally walked into, I think it was Walmart, and, uh, and there was one glorious package of toilet paper there. And it was like, I just found the golden ticket. <laughs> and uh, I was all excited. And uh, I come running across the store like I found a $50 bill. I'm like, hun, look what I found. 24 rolls, you know, <laughs> and uh, and she uh, and we all excited, and I and as a matter of fact, there was two rolls. As a matter of fact, because I told her, I said, there's a second one. Can we go grab that? And she goes, no, we're not going to be hoarders. Take what we need. We're going to go home. I was like, all right. So so I got to think about that. What if I just said, you know what? I'm not going to go out looking for rolls of toilet paper. I'm just going to lay on my couch, live, be a really good person, and maybe some toilet paper will roll up my lane <laughs> and work its way into my bathroom. It's a possibility. You know, we're going to try that. You know, how many toilet paper? You know, you're going to, you're only going to reap what you sow. <laughs> you know, and if you sit on your couch and you never go soul winning, then the odds are there's not going to be sinners rolling up your lane and saying, "Please tell me how to be saved." You know, you going, you, know, you, you it, soul winning works. Soul winning is 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 a method that absolutely positively works, and you'll reach way more people if you go than if you don't go. Number four. Why go soul winning? Because Christ set the example. Jesus Christ set the example. The, 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 the old slogan, everybody knows, what would Jesus do? Let me give you the answer. Luke chapter 19, verse 10 says, For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which is lost. Folks, that was the main reason. That was the reason why he came to this earth. Yeah, church. He started church. Yeah, yeah. He he gave us the uh, the ordinances, the Lord's Supper and baptism, and all that, and all, and all that stuff. Obviously, is good. But the, the, to sum this whole thing up, the reason why we're doing what we're doing is to seek and to save that which which was lost. Webster's defines seek. Listen to this: to go and search or quest of, to look for, to search for by going from place to place. What did Jesus? What did Jesus do? He lived his life. By going from place to place, seeking the lost. Folks, let me tell you something. Uh, what would Jesus do? We ask that. We hear that question all the time. Uh, the, the most prominent thing he did was soul win. And if we want to be like Christ, we have to be a soul winner. I know, I, I know this will fall on deaf ears. I know people are going to say, yeah, whatever, that's for you, preacher, that's not for me. But folks, let me tell you something. If you want to be like Christ, you're going to be a soul winner. 
Bottom line, that's who our Savior was. You just can't get around it. That matter of fact, we already established the the soul winning, preaching the gospel is not a suggestion. It is a clear command. He didn't say, "Well, if you get time, you know, you know, in your busy schedule, can you go out and tell somebody about me?" No, he didn't say that. He says, "Go ye." That was a direct command to me and you to get out and tell somebody about Christ. Now, let me read you another verse. I know this is going to step on some toes, and this will probably people be clicking off. But let me read you this. John 14, 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. How do you get around that? Soul winning is a command. Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. The sad part about it is the vast majority of this world of Christians, as we're going to look at, I'm going to read you a study here in just a minute, don't obey the number one command that he gave us. Matter of fact, that wasn't just once. There was, it, he's repeated preaching the gospel. All through the gospels, he told us to go out and tell people about him. Matter of fact, if you go to Acts chapter 1, just before his glorious ascension, he looked at him and said, you're going to be witness to me uh, uh, you know, in Jerusalem, Samaria, and to, all the way to the uttermost parts of the earth. The last thing he commanded before he ascended into heaven uh, was the, the last command was to remind them to preach the gospel, witness him to everybody in this world. Folks, let me tell you something. If you're not, if you're not going, if you're not actively looking for people to tell about Jesus Christ, whatever method you use, if you're not actively looking at it, you're in direct disobedience to a direct command given to me and you. I know that ain't popular, but I'm not here to be popular. Number five, why go so many? Because people are lost and on their way to hell. Turn to Luke chapter 16. I want you to go there for just a second. Luke chapter 16. I want to read you a popular verse, and you, most of you probably already know this, but John chapter, while you turn to Luke 16, I'm going to read you John 3, verse 16 and 18. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. There's the, there's the gospel in a nutshell, verse 16. We all know that verse. That, that God sent Jesus Christ to, to this world to die on an old, to, to seek and to save that which is lost by going to an old rugged cross, dying and raising from the dead. There's the gospel. And if you believe that, you, you're going to be saved. But listen to what it says in verse 17. For God sent not a son of the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Through him. Not through your good works, not through your church relationship, not through your genealogy, not through your denomination, not through any of that, but you're saved through him, through the work that he done on the cross. And then listen to verse 18. He that believeth on him is not condemned. In other words, the, the sin, as we talked about last Wednesday night, the sin that, that you, uh, the laws that you've broken, you're not going to be held accountable for them because Jesus paid it all. So if you're saved, you don't have to worry about that. But it says this, But he that believeth not is condemned already. Condemned right now. If you're lost, you're on your way to hell. I know that ain't a popular Facebook sermon or, or something that won't get many likes if you say that on, on social media because even the average Christian don't want to hear that. The bottom line is, if you're not in Christ, you're going to hell. It's as simple as that. I'm not a hellfire and brimstone preacher, but I, I, well, yeah, I am too. <laughs> I, 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 I want to tell people, uh, warn people about, about the fact that if you're lost, you're on your way. I had, I had a Jehovah, let me finish reading the verse. He said, why are they condemned already? Because he had not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. I had a friend tell me, he said, said, would you, he, he said if you've seen somebody with their hand on a stove, would you pull their hand off of it? He was a Jehovah's Witness. And I said, I said, absolutely, I do everything I can to make sure they don't do that. He said, well, why would God take, uh, put your hand on, on a stove and, and burn you? Why would he throw you in the flames of hell? I said, because it says in John 3.18, they're already on their way. If you read the previous verses, he sent Jesus to keep you from going there. But it's in our, it's in our you know, Psalms, one, uh, Psalms 9, verse 17 says, The wicked shall be turned into hell, and all the nations that forgot God. Folks, let me tell you something. Hell is real. No, let's read uh, real quick. I'm not going to preach. I just want to read Luke 16. Look at verse 19. You know the story. Uh, this is a story, uh, uh, an actual event that took place of a rich man that was lost and a, and a poor man that was saved, and they're two different destinations. Jesus tells us about this. Luke uh, 16, verse 19, follow along with me. It says, There was a certain rich man that was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. There was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores, 
And verse 21 says, And desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, and moreover the dogs came and licked his sores. So we see the see the, the, the rich man had no care for the poor. He had no he didn't demonstrate the compassion that Jesus had. He wasn't saved. And then verse 22 says, And it came to pass that the beggar died. He was saved. Look what it says. And was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. All right? Isn't that interesting? There was an angel. The saved man got an angelic escort right into heaven. Oh, I could preach on that. But then it says in verse, the end of verse 22, it says, The rich man di also died and was buried. No angelic escort. He just, his body went into the grave. And look at verse 23. It says, And in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. In hell, being in torments. I grew up in the 70s and 80s, and I remember ACDC singing a song, Highway to Hell. And uh, I, I just seen them uh, uh, online that they were singing that song and celebrating that song, talking about there's going to be a big party in hell. Boy, read the account here. There's no partying in hell. It says this rich man was in torments. Matter of fact, it says the rich man. Lazarus and Abraham had their names remembered, but the rich man, he was just the rich man. His identity was gone. They didn't know who he was. Verse 24 says, And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Do you see the torture that this man it was enduring the moment he entered hell? And to this day, folks, he's still going through that same thing. That even a drop of water seemed precious to him. Verse 25 says, But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receiveth thy good things. Remember, let's stop right there for a minute. He's in hell, you have your memory. You can remember things that happened while you were in your life. Remembering when you heard the gospel online and you, and you said no, clicked it off and went over and checked something else out. Remember when you came to church and you heard the gospel. Remember when somebody gave you a track on the street. Remember when somebody knocked on your door and, told, and you said no, 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 and you walked away. Remember, you got your memory. He says, and likewise, Lazarus, even thing, but now he is comforted and thou tormented. And then verse 26 says, uh, and besides this, all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that will come from thence. In other words, there's no hope for you. You're there. That's it. That's your eternal destiny. Verse 27, he said, Then he said, I pray thee, therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. All right, stop right there for a minute. This rich man in hell was concerned about his family, still alive on this earth. All right? Which, by the way, that's when you get saved. There, there's, once, once you die, there's no second chances according to Scripture. So he was concerned about his family. He remembered his family while he was tormented in the flames. Verse 28 says, For I have five brethren that he may testify. Tell them about Jesus Christ. Testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. His passion, his, he, was not, not, he was, had nothing to do with Christ, nothing to do with the Bible, nothing to do with God while he was on this earth. But boy, let me tell you something, his opinion changed. He became a soul winner in hell, but you know what? His soul winning was over. He said, I want you to go back. Would you send Lazarus back Would you tell, so, they could, so my family don't come here? Folks, I, I, the Bible says there's weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth in the flames of hell. And, and I, I don't mean to be graphic, and I don't mean to, but this goes along my sermon why we need to be passionate about souls. But I think the greatest, one of the, I don't even know how to wrap my brain around this, but one of the, the, the worst things to hear is the sound of a loved one that didn't get saved while you're down there. Verse 29 says, so he is, would you send would you send Lazarus back to tell my family? And in verse 29 says, Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. Moses and the prophets, that's, that's the Bible. They got the Bible, why don't they read their Bible? So, so listen what the, uh, verse 30, uh, And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they would repent. If, if, if Lazarus, who was dead, rose from the grave and went witnessed to him, they would, they would get saved. I, I bet you they would. And that's what he says. Verse 31 says, listen to what Abraham says. He says unto him, if, that, if they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded the one rose from the dead. What he's saying is the Bible is the most powerful witness you got. Folks, we ought to carry a King James Bible with us. We ought to be active about soul winning. We ought to be going out and telling people about Jesus Christ. That is, when you arm yourself with the Bible, the gospel, and you go out and tell somebody, you're, that's the greatest weapon you can fight against people going to hell. I just watched a video this morning. Uh, an atheist 
uh, a fellow uh, from Penn and Teller. Penn is the guy's name. I think I shared this video a while back on my Facebook. Uh, he just got done a show, and, uh, and a guy was a Christian, brought a little Gideon Bible, and made his way to Penn and wanted to tell him about Christ. He handed him a Bible and wanted to tell him how to be saved. And, and Penn was so impressed by this guy. Now, he's a devout atheist, and he, he's, he's vulgar. He don't like God and whatever, and, uh, and he said he was so impressed. Why? Because this guy cared enough about his soul that he wanted to tell him about Christ. Now listen, I quote, I typed this down, I watched the video this morning, and this is what Penn says. He says, if you believe there is a heaven or a hell, how much would you have to hate somebody not to proselyte? How much would you have to hate someone that everlasting life is possible and not tell them? Think about that. That atheist was telling the truth. How much, when you've got the good news about Jesus Christ, but you refuse to go out on the street, go to the guy at the grocery store, go to the, your neighbor. Go to, you've got the way out of hell. The, the, what we just read on Luke chapter 16. You've been given the good news of the gospel. How much do you have to hate someone not to go tell them how to be saved? Number six. Why go so away? Number six, believers know how to keep people from going to hell. We got the good news. I want to read you some verses. I want to read you some verses that really puts this whole thing in perspective, all right? 1 Corinthians 2, verse 14. Listen to what the Bible says. Let's talk about a lost person. It says, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. All right, let's stop right there. The natural man, that's talking about the lost person, the person that doesn't have Christ living in his heart, the Holy Spirit indwelling. He says, it says they receive not the things of the Spirit of God. They can't understand it. All right? Listen to what, and he gives more to Jacob. He says, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. They don't have the Holy Spirit. They, they may be able to look at the Bible. But it doesn't make any sense to them. This is why God sent uh, uh, um, uh, Philip to the Ethiopian eunuch because he was reading Isaiah 53 and he didn't. He said, "How can I know except some man show me?" Philip was the believer. The Ethiopian eunuch was the natural man that couldn't understand it. He didn't know what he was reading, even though he was reading the same words as Philip. He needed somebody to show him. Listen with uh, Romans chapter 10, verses 13 and 14. It says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Pretty simple. You come to Christ with a believing heart, you call on him and ask him to save you. That's how you be saved. All right, plain and simple. Then verse 14, Paul asks a couple of questions. How then shall they believe on him in whom they have or, or, or I'm sorry, no, how how then how shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? How are they going to do this if they don't believe? All right. Then he says, And how shall they believe in, uh, in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Folks, people need to call on Christ. They don't understand the Bible. They need somebody with a spirit, some spiritual discernment that understands the Bible. By the way, read 1 Corinthians chapter 2. We are indwelled with the Holy Spirit. God's given us the, His understanding to be able to go to the Bible and to be able to explain it to somebody. And He says, but how shall they hear without a preacher? If you don't go, if I don't go, they're not going to hear. If they're not going to hear, they're not going to believe. If they're not going to believe, they're not going to call. If they don't believe and call, they're not going to get saved. The, 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 the job has been laid at our feet. We've been commanded to go. Souls will pay the eternal price if we don't be obedient to this one very important repeated command to go out and preach the gospel. Let me use an illustration, a, a relevant today illustration. A fellow named uh, Senator Richard Burr of North Carolina. He's a chairman of the Senate Intelligence Committee. I was watching Tucker Carlson a couple weeks ago. And according to the news, according to Fox News, Tucker Carlson, this is what he says. He had information about the coronavirus uh, and, and the impact on how it would have in our nation before anybody else. He was on the Intelligence Committee. He knew about this before everybody else. And this is what Carlson said. But he didn't sound the alarm. He didn't tell anybody. He, he kept it under, under his hat. He knew people was going to die. 
He knew the pandemic that was going to cause. He had a good idea of what was going to happen, but he, he, he didn't sound the alarm. What he did, he sat on the informa information knowing what the impact was going to have. Why did he do that? For selfish reasons. Why? Because he had a lot of money in the stock market. And he didn't want the market to crash until he got his money out of the way. I think another, there was another senator who got in trouble, or at least under questioning for that, according to the news. So he did it for selfish reasons. Instead of sounding alarm so America could get prepared, he waited, he sat on the information, just so he could, be, he could personally gain from this, pulled all his money out of the stock market, even said, you know, everything's going to be fine. Yeah, don't worry about it. Everything's going to be fine. While he took care of his own personal stuff, the, you know, the information he had was valuable so people could get prepared, so, so people could be ready for when, when this, this thing would come and people's died because of this. People's, you know, well, I think 30 or 10 million people, I believe, is unemployed right now. People are hurting. He had information. And then I'd watch the news and many people were outraged over this guy. I can't believe he would do this. I can't believe he sat on the information. The comments on Facebook just, man, this guy ought to be railroaded and whatnot. He, you know, he was more concerned about self than the welfare of others. Folks, let me tell you something. Don't judge him if you're not preaching the gospel. Because you've been given valuable information. How to keep people out of eternal destruction. And if you sit on your rear end and say, I'm not going to go. I'm afraid to go. I don't want to take the time to learn how to present the gospel. I don't want to take one hour out of my week. Then you're withholding valuable information that, for selfish reasons that might save somebody for all eternity. Bible.org. I did some research. I got some statistics. According to Bible.org, get this. This is an eye-opener. I was blown away when I read this. 95% of Christians have never won a soul to Christ. Hmm. 95%, 85% of all Christians do not constantly witness for Christ. That's staggering. Less than 2% are involved in any kind of soul winning ministry at all. That blows my mind. 71% of Christians do not, finance, do not finan financially support the Great Commission in any way. Think about that. It, it, yeah, the effects... Of the senator, if he would have just went and told somebody, he could probably save some people's lives. But the effects of Christians keeping silent, not going out and telling somebody, not looking for Christians or looking for lost people, is going to affect people for eternity. And be, and that's why I wanted to read Luke chapter 16 so we understand. So let's let's wrap this up. Number seven, why go so winning? Number seven, believers will stand and before God and give account one day. Turn to Ezekiel chapter 33. Ezekiel chapter 33. Believers will stand before God one day. We've been commanded. We understand the ramifications if we don't go. We understand we're going to reap what we sell. We're going to, we understand that we're going to reap according to what we sell. We understand, we understand that, that there's lost people that just don't understand the Bible and they need somebody to show them. We understand all that. We understand that Christ repeatedly commanded us to go. The last thing he said. So there's no excuse. We can't say, well, Lord, we didn't know. In, in, in Ezekiel 33, the watchman on the wall, most of you probably know this, this passage. I want to read verses 1 through 9. I want you to understand. This is an illustration. We, we are the watchmen. Christian, we are the watchmen on the wall. Let's just read uh, Ezekiel 33. Let's look at verse 1. It says, Again, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, speak to the children of thy people, and say unto them, When I bring the sword upon the land, if the people of the land take a man of their, of their coast and set him for their watchmen. <laughs> We've been set as a watchman on the wall. Verse 3 says, If when he seeth the sword come upon the land, and he blow the trumpet and warn the people. Alright? Alright? He sees, he sees the, the, the sword coming. He sees the danger coming. He sees the destruction coming. And if he stands up and blows the trumpet and says, Here it comes. Warning them. Get ready. He says, Then whenever, uh, whoever, whosoever heareth the sound of the trumpet and taketh not warning, if the sword come and take him away, his blood shall be upon his own head. 
Hey, it's your fault because you didn't. You heard the watchman blow the trumpet, but you said, "I ain't worried about it. Don't worry about it." Then you, you're not held accountable. He said, "You know, you know." And the same thing, preacher, preachers. I'm talking to Christians. If you tell people about Christ, God's put somebody in your life to tell them about Christ, and you've warned them, and they just said, "No, there's no blood on your hands." All right. Well, look, verse 5, it says, He heard the sound of the trumpet and took not warning. His blood shall be upon him, but he that taketh warning shall deliver his soul. In other words, when you blow that trumpet and people hear it and, and they, get, uh, they get saved, he said, then you just use the gospel to reach somebody to get them saved. But look at verse 6. But if the watchmen see the sword come and blow not the trumpet... Then, and the people be not warned, if the sword come and take any person from among him, he is taken away in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at the watchman's hand. Think about that. Let's just read uh, verse, uh, keep going, verses 7 down through 9. So thou son of man, I have set thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore thou shalt hear the word at my mouth, and warn them from me. When I say unto the wicked, O wicked man, thou shalt surely die, if thou dost not speak to warn the wicked from his way, that the wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. Preacher. That's what he talk, he's talking to the preacher. He says, nevertheless, verse 9, if thou warn the wicked of his way and turn and to turn from it, if he do not turn from his way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou has delivered thy soul. In other words, the watchman, the one has, who's got the trumpet, as far as preaching the gospel, if you sound the trumpet, if you sound the trumpet, then and you tell people about Christ, God says, I'm not going to require no blood in your hands, but if, you're, if you've been given the gospel, and folks, let me tell you something, we have. We have been given the gospel trumpet. We have been given the command to go out and blow it before the loss. We've been given the command. And the accountability is that you're going to stand one day. And, and, and yeah, this is hard preaching. I know that. I know probably half of y'all don't want to hear it. And I, I know in the average Christian said, well, I just don't want to do that. I've even heard Christians go as far as saying, well, we're not supposed to do that. The Bible disagrees with you strongly. And the bottom line is if we're not going... If we're not going, then we're in straight disres uh, 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 disrespect, ignoring a direct command of God, and we will be held accountable. I know this kind of preaching won't get many clicks. I know this kind of preaching won't fill the church pews. But folks, let me tell you something. Desperate times calls for desperate measures. And we need, especially at a time like this, be preaching the gospel. We need to be ready to tell everybody about Christ. God has prepared the ground, and we need to be ready. So let me close with this. So what do we do? Maybe at the moment you're not actively soul winning. How do you get started? Well, number one, pray and ask God for a passion <laughs> like Paul had, like Christ had. A compassion, a passion to tell somebody about Christ. Number two, educate yourself on soul winning. Learn the Romans road. Learn. Yeah, let me tell you something. The first time you go out, you're not going to be the best soul winner. You're going to make some mistakes. You're going to, just like riding a bike, you fall a few times. But the more you do it, the better you get at it. The more confident you get at it, the more souls you're going to see saved. Uh, matter of fact, Wednesday nights, I'm starting this series. Uh, I'll probably go at least a month on this, on, on how, how to be a soul winner. I, I, I'm educating you on how to do that. I've been soul winning since 1998. I've learned a few things, and I'll share those with you. Number three, find a partner to go with. You know, you find somebody that that you know that that you can go. Don't rely on church programs. Well, my church don't my church don't have so many programs. Well, our church does, <laughs> but yeah. You know, but find somebody. Find somebody to go with. You don't have to wait on somebody. Just so you, hey, do you, hey, number four, set aside an hour a week and, and say that's my hour where I'm going to walk up the street, hand tracks out, and tell somebody about Jesus Christ. You know, just set in your mind, say, I'm going to commit to this just as I'm committing to my Bible study, just as I'm committing to my prayer, just as I'm, I'm going to commit time to go out and just blow the trumpet. And folks, and maybe nobody will warn or listen to your warning, but that's all right. There'll be no blood on your hands. Folks, let me tell you something. Right now, there is a stay-at-home order. People are scared. The lost are questioning. God's plowed the ground. He's made the ground firm. And, and folks, it's our job to go out and start planting seeds. I'm going to close with this. Listen to what Jesus says. Say ye not that there are four months, and then come at the harvest. Listen to what he says. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, 
for they are white already to harvest. Folks, let me tell you something. The ground is plowed. The field is white. Get your trumpet in your hand. Get ready and find some time to get out on the street. I know right now we're in a stay-at-home order. But folks, the storm's going to pass by soon. And be ready. Educate yourself while you are at home. Get into your Bible along your Romans road. Collect your tracks. Get ready. And then when it's time, boy, let's get out there and start planting some seeds. Let's get out there and start blowing the trumpet. Amen. Alrighty. Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you, Lord, for this day you've given us. Thank you for the privilege it is, Lord, to, uh, to witness the gospel. Lord, I thank you for the privilege it is to, to tell people about Christ. I pray for State Line Baptist Church. Help us to be the soul-winning church that you expect us to be. Help us, Lord, to reach the, uh, the world with the gospel of Christ. Help us to plant churches, Lord, where those, where the, in those areas that need a church house, to, Lord, to be able to grow more Christians. Father, help us to be obedient. Lord, I lift up, uh, Lord, I know we got right now, I want to pray for at least two nurses that are in our church or in the front lines right now. Lord, I lift those up before you. I pray and ask you to be, be with them, protect them as they're in the hospitals, be with their families. And Lord, I pray and ask, Lord, that you would just protect our church. I know there's some losing jobs right now, Lord. I pray and ask that you would bless them. But Lord, we know you're doing something. Lord, help us to endure this storm. Help us till the storm goes by. Help us to be draw close to you. And Lord, when we're, when, whenever this goes by, we're ready to serve you. Father, we love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Don't forget tonight. I'm going to make sure you get this right. Uh, don't forget, tune in tonight. I'm going to be preaching on the new creature. Uh, I'm going to give you a few things on, uh, on that happens the moment you get saved. Uh, a little different spin on it uh, uh, as far as uh, I've preached on this before. But, uh, and Brother Kara Speck uh, sent me a video. We're going to be playing that. He's going to sing a little bit for us as well tonight. So 5 o'clock, just like regular church service, be here, tune in, and we'll be preaching. God bless.